Ed Kemper was detained in a mental hospital from the age of 21 for the murder of his grandparents, but was later released in the advice of psychiatrists. Within two years, he had decapitated and mutilated six students as well as his mother and her best friend. He sometimes raped the corpses. In 1973, he gave himself up since when Ed Kemper has been detained in a reform hospital in California. Vacaville Prison near San Francisco is the largest prison in the West with around 10,000 inmates. Ed Kemper teaches computer science here and takes part in a program recording literature for the blind, all of which will help him earn early remission. Hi. My younger sister's two years younger and I developed some morbid games. Um, my life had started going that way at about eight. At a certain time of the evening, the family left the center room, the, the living room of the house. My mother and my sisters, or my sisters themselves, would go up to bed upstairs, where I used to go to bed, upstairs. I had to go down to the basement, and an eight-year-old child had a tough time differentiating the reason in that. Why am I going to the basement? I'm going to hell, they're going to heaven. And what were those games that you played with your sister? Okay. Well, the one I remember uh, someone talking about in a, in a book was one who was playing gas chamber or electric chair or something. And we had this big old overstuffed chair up in my room. And we'd, we'd uh, it was not just my sister and I, it was my sister and I and a friend close friend. We got into all these games. We got into one game where we'd roll up in a rug and a person would try to get out of it. It's just like a large throw rug. And it was, uh, I guess, what fascinated us individually about it is it was a completely, uh, it broke up the monotony, I guess, of what we were doing. Didn't have a lot of toys to play with. Uh, we got bored with those pretty quickly. So we looked for things to do. You roll up in the rug and, and you try to get out and the other two would leave the room and we see who could get out fastest. You know, you try to work your way out sideways or scoot out the end of it or whatever. And uh, we went from that to being tied in this overstuffed chair with a cord or something or, or pieces of sheet or sash or something. And uh, we went through this process. I guess we're, that's back when, in 1960 when uh, Carol Chessman was executed. What were those fantasies? What were they? Yes. Um, possessing the severed heads of women. Men didn't turn me on. That wasn't very, I couldn't appreciate the appearances of a guy. That when I was young, I was about eight or nine years old, I went to a, this little, come on, it was like at a record store or something, and they had this crowd of kids there, and there was a magic show. And this guy, you've probably seen it, the fake guillotine, hand-pressed, and they put the potato there, and someone puts their neck in the, uh, in the brace, and they slam this thing down, and the potato down below chops in two, but the person's head doesn't fall off, right? And everybody gets very fascinated by that. Oh, my God. And then when he puts the blade in place and he pushes it down, it goes through that neck hole, but it never chops anybody's head off. Okay, so he wanted a volunteer out of the, I'm not standing in this crowd watching this show, and he wanted a volunteer out of the audience, and some quite beautiful little 16-year-old girl gets up there, and this big laugh, and you know, all giddy and stuff, and I started getting caught up in this. I said, wow. Right at that moment, I departed reality, because logically, I should have been able to ascertain that that could not happen. You're not going to get away with chopping somebody's head off in the middle of, uh, <laughs> in the middle of Helena, Montana, the capital city. Um, but the concept of it was so raw and it was titillating, I says, wow, gee, I gotta watch this. And he had her girlfriend come over and put her hands there to catch her head so it wouldn't fall in the basket, you know. And he was making jokes about this. I got caught up in this, this, um, this interplay between normal concerns. You don't want to get a bump on her head. Well, hey, if you're chopping her head off, it doesn't matter, right? And this is catching in my mind somehow, and I'm saying, wow. Uh, the first time, okay, 
Uh, the two girls were killed around 6 p.m. By 11 the next morning, they are both completely gone out of my life, physically. All right? That's not even 24 hours. The third murder, which is the second incident, okay, uh, I'm in the middle of trying to get my record sealed. Right? Thursday night, I killed her. I took off Friday. I didn't go to work. I called in sick, took CTO. All right? Dismembered her body. Got rid of her body, but kept her head in her hands because they're identifiable. They're highly identifiable. I kept those at the apartment. Okay? That Friday night, uh, Thursday night, I took her. Friday, uh, Friday morning, she was dismembered. Friday night, she was disposed of. Right? Saturday morning, I left. Right? And I didn't have, I wasn't satisfied that I, I took the head along in the hands, but I didn't, I couldn't put them someplace that I would, could be sure they wouldn't be dug up by an animal or just be somewhere. It was, it's scary going out there trying to bury somebody or dispose of body parts in a community or out in the, even in the boonies where you don't know where you're at and who can come up at any moment. I had some real close calls there where people had come out of nowhere. And if they, if a body's found and they remember this beige looking car sitting there the night, that's evidence. So it was very, very hard to get rid of this stuff. So anyway, Saturday morning, I went to see the psychiatrist in Fresno. Saturday afternoon, I saw the other one. Saturday evening, I'm with my fiance and her family over in Turlock. Sunday night, I come back to my apartment. Could you tell us how long you've been in prison? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this month is 18 years that I've actually been in prison. What were you convicted of? Eight counts of first-degree murder. And um, what was your sentence? Seven years to life, um, CC, that's called uh, concurrent. It means all the sentences run at the same time. Two years uh, before you committed the crimes, uh, I think you traveled quite a lot on the freeways at night or picking up hitchhikers. During the day. During the day. Yeah. I traveled a lot because I'd been locked up for five and a half years. I had never had a license. Well, I'd just gotten a license when I got locked up the first time, a Montana license. And uh, uh, so I was free. The driving around was a, a way to exhibit that freedom, to demonstrate it, to get the cobwebs out of me. When I first got out, I loved to drive. I always did love as a kid to drive. I started driving when I was 10 or 12 years old but I got a license when I was 15 up in Montana, and then I got locked up and then uh, here in California, and I got out, got a license, and I just started driving. And that was my main hobby, I'd say. And I saw a lot of people out hitchhiking, and I didn't select girls to pick up. I picked up anybody who wanted a ride. And over that whole three-year period, it was the same way. If someone needed a ride, I picked them up, unless specifically I was looking for someone to do in. The crimes, are, it goes from, uh, from May to May September, 7th. May 7th, Sunday, to Thursday, September 14th. Then it hops over to January, right? And then to February. It's speeding up. It's coming to a head. It's getting to where, uh, it wasn't a cyclical thing, but it was coming to where uh, it was coming more often. And something I didn't tell a whole lot of people, I guess I did tell in one interview, uh, Shortly before it all ended, I drove up to the Bay Area, and I was, well, I was living there. I was up in, in Alameda. But I was living with my mother in Santa Cruz and commuting because I had to work up there, and I stayed with a friend. I went out to Berkeley, and I drove Ashby Avenue, one of the places I used to drive, looking for co-eds. And I drove from uh, Highway 80 up Ashby Avenue to Highway 13. The first two co-eds I killed were on Ashby Avenue. They were five foot two, slight of figure, you know, uh, we call petite. And, and one's black hair, one's blonde hair, okay? And I'm driving the opposite direction up Ashby Avenue. It's a year later. I'm seeing if I can maintain. I'm not hunting. I'm out seeing if I can maintain. I have a weapon in the car. I have everything else fitting the, the situation. I'm seeing if I can maintain. If I can just let go of it and maintain and marry this young lady and go on. I go driving up there, and here's these two young ladies five foot two, one's got blonde hair, one's got black hair, they're in granny dresses and I'm having shit fits because it's like deja vu. And I, oh my God, and I just, I acted in a way that they wouldn't be paranoid because I'm a young man by myself in this car. I diffused the situation as I drove up. I'd gotten practice at that. 
all that driving around. It wasn't rehearsing. I made a game out of driving around, picking people up, and later on I discerned that some people wouldn't get in my car because of the situation. I'm a young man by myself. It's unsafe. So I thought, well, gee, I, you know, that kind of put me off. I'm not doing anything to anybody, so I want to see if I can change that situation where they'll want to get in and I can take them where they're going because I know I'm not going to do anything. And I got to where I could diffuse that situation. It's how you're looking. If you look, oh boy, I already start cranking the car over there. They're not going to get in your car because they can see you from half a block away drooling. But if you look at your watch and say, geez, I don't know if I have enough time, and you're kind of in the mirror and looking around, ah, and you pull over, hey, this guy's just a businessman going somewhere. I can get in his car, we'll go where we're going. And it's little games I played so they'd get in the car. And then we chatted, and I talked about things, and I found out where their orientations were, and their little, what they used to judge, and who could get in, and who they could get in with, and who they couldn't, right? In that sense, it's been interpreted as, as, uh, as what do you call it, rehearsing. It's not true. It's like playing chess and then turning it into something ugly. I played chess casually. I played chess more and more thoroughly till I got very good at it, which was picking up people to where I could make you a bet. I can pick up those two ladies. And they'd say, oh man, you're crazy. Those are two very crafty young ladies who won't get in a car with a young man by himself, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd win the bet because I knew how to defuse the situation. Even if they asked, where are you headed, right? And they had a sign saying where they're going, but they'd ask, or if they, even if they didn't, they'd say, where are you headed? And I had ways of developing it to where they wouldn't get suspicious. But I didn't mean I was going to kill them. It meant I was playing a game. And then later, when I started killing people, I used that against them. But initially, it was just a hobby. It was a habit. It was trying to fill in the blanks of five and a half years of not being in society. I missed that flower child generation. I missed the entry into Vietnam, all that stuff. And all these kids are like aliens to me. Yeah, I say kids. I missed 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. I'm supposed to be associating with people in their adult years, but I missed a big chunk, so I'm out there trying to fill in the gaps. Find out why these kids are the way they are now, because they were totally different from the kids that I was, when I was that age, totally different. And I'm trying to fill the gaps in, and then later I changed that to something ugly. And why? My mother works at the university. My mother won't introduce me to any young ladies at the university because I'm like my father and I don't deserve to know any of those young ladies. So here she is holding these little girls up there as too good for me. Very special. If anything, I was destroying icons. I was hurting her without her even knowing it. Again, it's that picky, little petty, uh, ineffectual, I'm getting back at you but I don't have the heart to tell you what I'm doing. See? Why would I admit those things on a camera? That's embarrassing. It's humiliating. And how would you select your victims? Were they... I didn't select them. It was random. And it was uh, also the, the development of the passion. If I was drove, they died. Like the last two victims. I was so pissed I'd have killed anybody who got in a car. You said you had a lot of sympathy and empathy towards Marianne Pesce when you talked to her. But isn't that strange to say that after you had killed her? in such a brutal fashion. There was a draw. There was a draw to the young lady. It was haunting. I'm not saying I had compassion toward her when I talked to her. I tried to remember what we talked about. And in fact, I think it, what I said about her was is that she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady. She's kind of stuck up, distant. I look back on it and I see a girl that was not beautiful. She was not plain. She was somewhere in between. And she was caught up in that beauty thing like kids in the valley are, okay? Valley girls trying to make something of themselves and exploit little attributes they have and to downplay other ones. And she was playing a little Miss Distant with me. And her friend was very open and very, her roommate was very open and very a country girl talking and stuff. And it's sad because the Pesh was the, uh, Marianne was the uh, expert at hitchhiking. She had been half her life in Europe. She'd hitchhiked around Europe. Uh, she'd done it in the United States. She was good at it. She didn't want to get in the car. The other girl, Anita Luchessa, wasn't a hitchhiker. She'd been raised by her family. Don't do things like that. That's totally out of line. And her friend talked her into it. And once she got into it and she saw how much fun it was and they meet the different people and they talk with people, that by the time they're leaving Berkeley, right, it's all about who gets the front seat and who gets the back seat. So she, she, uh, you know, she opened the door and asked where uh, I was headed. 
I mean, it says Stanford right on their, the sign they were holding up. And I said, I'm going to Palo Alto. I can drop you off. Oh, great. And she jumps in, grabs her stuff, jumps in, opens the back seat up for her friend, who's standing there looking at me long and serious about whether or not, because I could tell at the time, she knows better than to get in. Single adult, it's a coupe instead of a four-door car, so she cannot get out other than through the front seat. So that's all the warning signs of not getting in with a single, you know, in that kind of a situation. Uh, all of the things were wrong about it. But when I drove up, I pulled that little stunt of looking at my watch. You know, do I have time to pick them up? And you wouldn't believe how much effect that kind of thing has. And when she kept staring at me and looking, looking for something wrong in my eyes, I gave this look back like, I don't understand. Why are you, why are you looking at me like this? I gave her that back, and she says, oh, this guy's a dork. He's innocent as hell. She gets in. Okay. We're driving along, and I'm looking at this young lady in the rearview mirror. And I look back at it years later, and I'm saying, she kept looking me back, too, right in the eyeballs. I'm wearing dark glasses, but they're not totally dark. And I'm realizing now that she could see me looking at her, and she was looking right back at me. And instead of saying something to me, like, what are you looking at? Or, hey, maybe you ought to drop us off or something like that. She just kept looking back at me. And I'm looking at her, and she keeps looking at me. And I'm thinking she's playing this little game. It's, uh, it's not really teasing so to speak. It's just this little psychological game back and forth that men and women do sometimes. The young girl in the front, uh, Anita, was uh, at one point in the, in, the, in the driving, and I'm sure they were doing little looks at each other and little comments that I didn't pick up because I'm driving and looking for places to go, that uh, somewhere in that communication, she gave me this sexy little look, you know, like, oh boy, you know, you're a pretty good looking guy, you know, da-da-da. And uh, I smiled back at her but not this hungry, oh, yeah, yeah, I'd like to get down with you kind of thing. It was just I smiled back at her, and I saw it for what it was. It's an 18-year-old girl that's feeling her oats. She's not doing anything wrong. It's, it's sad and it's real pathetic, but some of this stuff was, I was getting real caught up in this girl in the back seat. You know, I was, uh, she was, you know, to me, at that point, she was really beautiful. She had the most incredible blue eyes, right? She had this really shiny black hair that was turning me on. And I was getting drove because I just kept playing this game of picking people up, and, and I had plugged in those fantasies of killing people. And, you know, the titillating little fantasies, and I says, geez, uh, I keep walking away from that. And I put myself down as being weak for not being able to do something about that. Right? So I kept driving and driving on myself, saying, I gotta do something, I gotta do something about this. How were you feeling while you were killing? What? Well, he said especially the first two, which were very messy. It was a shock that first time. That horrified me. I did everything stupid, everything wrong, if I were trying to get away with it. It was just really, really dumb. The knife I fell back on, that was a fallback position. I was trying to smother her. And that didn't work. And she was struggling against that and arguing with me about it. And uh, uh, I got frustrated, and I reached in my pocket, I had that folding knife, and I pulled it out, and for a lot of years, and I, I, I made a point of saying back then with the investigators, when I pulled the knife out and locked it in a place, it clicked, and she said, what's that? That's a quote. What's that? And she was kind of like a, yeah, yeah, naggy kind of thing. What's that? And I couldn't figure out why she said that. Like, it's not that big an impact, a little clicking sound behind her you know, amongst what's going on, and it hadn't been murderous up to that point. It had been an aggravation, and I was, I had her tied up, or handcuffed. And uh, uh, it took me years to, for it to dawn on me, trying to look at it from different points of view to understand these things, why she said that. You know why she said that? Because I had brandished this gun, and I had cocked it once, and it clicked. So in her mind, very possibly, I had pulled the gun out and was going to shoot her. So she said, what's that? And thinking I've pulled the gun out now and I'm cocking it. Not realizing I'd pulled a knife out. I still had the gun in my pants. I stabbed her. She didn't fall dead. You're supposed to fall dead. You're supposed to go, oh, and fall dead. I've seen it in all the movies, right? Doesn't work that way. When you stab someone, they leak to death. They lose blood pressure and you stab them more and more and more. You complicate it many times by where you're hitting, the pain you're causing, and the aggravation of the person involved, plus whether or not they leak a little faster. 
it wasn't working worth the damn. I stabbed her all over her back, and, and she even turned around. I stabbed her in the side and the stomach once. Why? As she turned around, I could have stabbed her through the heart. But her breasts were there, and it actually deflected me. I couldn't see stabbing a young woman in her breast. That's embarrassing. I didn't say that to them back then. I don't think I may have. But that's humiliating to admit that, that I was that affected by her presence. I stabbed her in the belly. That had to hurt worse. I didn't do it to make it hurt. I was trying to shut her up. And she ended up getting her thro throat cut. And uh, I learned the term ear to ear, what that meant, because that's the way it went. And uh, she went out of it completely right then. She lost consciousness and uh, died probably just moments after that. But I just backed up out of the car. My hands are covered in blood. And I'm saying, oh, God, I did it. I did it. I don't believe it. I did it. Shit, I've done it. Now I've got to kill the other one. And at, toward the end, when I picked those two girls up, and I said they were just like the first two, like Marianne Passion and Anita Luchessa, who'd haunted me all this time. And now two more just like them get in the car. We drive up 13, and we get to this figure eight uh, cloverleaf interchange where it hits 580. And they want to go under the freeway and back up on and head out this way. And out that way, I happen to know, just a couple of miles down the road, is Palomares Drive, where I took Anita Luchessa and Marianne Pesci and killed them. Mills College is back this way, toward downtown. They don't think so. They want to go this way. I'm saying, gee, you don't want to go that way, and I can't tell them why. You do not want to go that way. Mills College is this way. Well, no, we, uh, we go there, and we know where it's, we live there, and, and uh, we want to go. And as we're approaching this interchange, I'm saying, no, we need to go in the right lane, get up on the freeway and go downtown. You want to get in the left lane, go under, cross up, and that's going to be another step closer to you dying. Because even if I don't go all the way out to Palomares Road, up 580, if I stop where it starts to go out in the country and I get back on the freeway, that's where I used to work on the highways. That's one of the places where it's a cul-de-sac. You drive down there, it's a very quiet street, comes down up onto the freeway very sharply, and they're dead if these urges take over. And if I go that way, it's not encouraging me to stop. It's testing beyond where I want to test. We've already gone beyond that by them getting in the car because, geez, it's just like those first two. I was actually scared to death I was going to kill them. And I, by that point, I had killed all of the co-eds. It was two months after the last two. And I'm seeing if I can pull out of it, like, like drinking or something or smoking. And at the point where we're bickering, if they'd started shrieking or banging on the windows, I'm busted. They're going to pull me over, someone's going to call a cop or something, and they're going to get me and probably bust me on these other cases on a fluke, and I'm trying to save their lives. I don't want them going that way because I know Mills College is this other way. They get scared shitless. And, oh my God, we shouldn't have gotten this guy's car and they're getting all puckered up. And, oh, and, and I said, just bear with me, be patient. If I'm wrong, we'll get on the turnoff, we'll go right back around, we'll take you out your way. But I know it's the next turnoff or the one past it this way, downtown. Trust me, please. And they're sitting like this and they quit talking to me and they're looking straight ahead. And I'm saying, oh shit. Guns under the seat, it's all just, you know, whoa. I get up on the freeway, two turnoffs, Mills College. In fact, the next one said Mills College next exit, you know. But they're not, not relaxing or nothing. I had refused to take them the way they wanted to go and pushed it the other way. That's what scared them. But they didn't know the irony of it was if I'd have gone along their way, I'd have probably said, yeah, yeah, well, I'll just follow on through and oops, we'll do it one more time. How do you oops human lives? Two young, I don't know those two young ladies. And I don't know where they are today. And I don't know that they remember that little incident. But when I drove them to Mills College, inside of Mills College, to their college entrance, right to the building, to the dormitory. And they got out of that car and flew up those stairs. Never even looked back. I'll bet they quit hitchhiking quite so casually after that. But you know what? I don't think they know to this day how close that came. And, and the irony of it is, it just, to, just to shut them up and not have them freak out, I could have gone the other way. But by that time, then we're going back up that groove of what I had done already and what I was familiar with. See what I'm saying? And that day, I knew I could not stop doing it. I knew I had no control over it. I had just minimal controls. But mainly, I could not stop it. It was going to happen again. And between that weekend day, 
It was a Saturday or a Sunday. I think it was a Sunday. Between that Sunday and the next Saturday, all that week I was working, I built an image in my head, my mother's going to die. I'm going to kill her, and I am going to go to it with the police, and we're going to hold court in the street, and they're going to pound me in the ground, and they can fill in the blanks because I don't want to be around to explain it. All that week, I just it was a conviction that just got deeper and deeper in me. I got more and more morose. I got less and less talkative at work. I got more somber about what I was doing because every, almost every minute of every day, I knew that's what that next weekend held. That was Easter weekend, right? Worked half a day Friday, went back to Santa Cruz Friday afternoon, was drinking Friday night, fell asleep before my mother came home, woke up after she came home. And the last words we had were an argument, right? I walked into her bedroom to chat with her. I was, I, in the back of my mind, I'm not going to try and blame her for dying. I'm just saying, in the back of my mind, I was hoping she could say something or I'd say something that could stop all of this shit. A little childish hope in the back of my mind that she'd say something and I'd just, I'd play it off. I'd, I'd, but you still went with the hammer. And wait a minute, wait a minute. You're, you're wiping out the moment here. I went in there hoping I could stop this stuff in the back of my head. I'm not planning on it. I'm just a little hope. And the first thing out of her mouth was she's reading this book and she just flaps it down on herself and says, oh my God, I suppose now you want to stay up all night and talk. That was one of her favorite peeves when I come in late at night and want to talk. And once in a long while, like that night, I spun on my heel and said, nope, good night, and walked back out. And she knew she'd hurt my feelings. And the next day we'd sit down and talk. Except I knew that we weren't going to talk. And I went back in my room and I laid down. I did not go to sleep. I laid there for four, well, three hours, four hours, till four, five in the morning. A little after five in the morning and walked in there with a hammer. And caved in the side of her head. And cut her throat.